Wah! How's it going, everybody? Today I'm standing in a little bit of a different part of my studio uh, to give a little bit of a different introduction. So my team and I are uh, currently neck deep in trying to edit this Philip Zeba video. I thought it was going to be about two hours long. Uh, it is currently almost four. So because of that, we decided we're going to just keep our heads down, keep working on it, because when it is done, I want it to be perfect. So we're not going to rush it. We're going to just get it done and release it when it's ready. But to keep the post schedule going, I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to release a video that I think all of you will enjoy. I talk a lot about pseudoscience and pseudoarchaeology pretty much all the time, but I've never talked about pseudoarchaeology and pseudoscience as a concept. Why it's dangerous, why people kind of fall into it, and how it's a pipeline into much more dangerous ideologies. So today, I think it's high time I talk to you guys about pseudoarchaeology and science communication. What you're about to see is a lecture that I gave at Virginia Tech back a couple months ago. So I encourage you to, in true classroom fashion, dim the lights, grab a drink of water, and enjoy. I'd also like to give a big thanks to Virginia Tech for allowing me to speak there. So that was an absolute blessing. Thank you very much for having me at your institution. That's a huge honor. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, why don't we take a trip down to Blacksburg and uh, do a little bit of a lecture, shall we? Enjoy. All right, six o'clock, 6.05, let's do this. Is this, if I press this, will something horrible happen? Is this the light know. switch? <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. Uh, <laughs> all right. Oh. Oh. Okay. Dramatic. This lighting is what we're going to work with, and it's not so bad. So, uh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, firstly, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of you for coming out here today. I'm really happy to be here. I know that I've been looking forward to this for a while. I'd like to thank Grace for helping put this together. Um, and I'm happy to see so many uh, non history club faces have made their way down here. Um, and it really is an honor to uh, be here talking at Virginia Tech today. This is uh, really a, a very exciting occasion. Uh, so, I suppose we're going to just get right into it. Uh, howdy, everyone. My name is Milo Rossi. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit about my work uh, doing science communication and talking about pseudoarchaeology and more broadly, the implications of the pseudoscience pipeline. So uh, throughout this presentation, if you guys have any questions or anything like that, just feel free to raise your hands and I'll take them. I'll have some time for questions at the end where we can kind of just go crazy, but I know that I often will lose questions if I don't ask them right away. So please don't be afraid to interrupt me if you have something burning in your mind. So let me give you a little bit of background on myself. Who am I? Uh, so I am a graduate of the University of Maine. I attended UMaine from 2018 through 2022, uh, where I got to uh, be there when COVID happened, which was so much fun. Uh, up there is uh, me as a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed freshman in front of the town of Milo, just a handful of miles north of campus. Um, I originally went to the University of Maine for environmental science. Uh, before going to college, I went to a Voc Tech high school. And so while I was there, I did four years of environmental science and assumed that that was going to be my my career path. When I ended up going to university, I was kind of steered against doing archaeology by some of my advisors who were kind of like, ah, just don't even bother. Why would you ever do that? So I was like, okay, I'll just do environmental science. And about halfway through college, I was like, why am I doing that? I had some classes that were really inspirational with professors who taught me a lot about archaeology and sort of revitalized that passion. And so about halfway through my time at UMaine, I adopted that as well. And then I just crammed my schedule full of as many archaeology and anthropology classes as I could until I graduated in 2022. So who am I? Um, I would hazard a guess that many of you sitting here probably have some inkling of who I am, but I'll kind of do a little brief resume uh, for those of you interested. So I am an archaeologist. Uh, I am an environmental scientist. Uh, I am an author. This is my book, The Encyclopedia of the Weird and Wonderful. Uh, I have done archaeological guides. Here are two of my recent trips. This was in the Sacred Valley of Peru this past fall, and this is in uh, the Shunlurfa region of Turkey uh, that happened back uh, this past spring. Uh, but more broadly, and sort of the general compass that I fall under, and the reason I do all of these things is because I am a science communicator. My primary platforms are TikTok and YouTube, where I produce both short and long form content debunking various pseudo archaeological concepts. At the time of me making this presentation, I have 1.7 million subscribers on YouTube uh, and 1.9 million uh, on TikTok. So what do I do exactly? I do a lot of things, but we're going to keep it brief here. Uh, my primary thing, sort of my bread and butter, the thing that I started off doing on kind of the social media world was debunking pseudo-archaeology and pseudoscience more generally. Um, I got my start on TikTok back in, I think, 2021, um, where I sort of would discuss short form uh, pseudo-archaeology content and break it down into its uh, you know, minutia. Um, and from there, I sort of branched out. I uh, really got my start because I loved talking about archaeology. I loved teaching about archaeology. 
sociology, and so I would also use my platform to talk about non-pseudoscience things, using it as a place to actually uplift true stories instead of just wasting my breath on people who are saying things that are wrong. Um, so I try to incorporate a lot of lessons throughout what I teach, both in my short but especially in my long-form content, uh, talking about the other things that I'm passionate about, environmental science, uh, geology, and biology. I am a firm believer, and as I'm sure many of you will agree with me, that uh, science is an interdisciplinary field. And so I think it's much more important to sort of show how all of these things are tied together rather than just isolating each one, because it's like a machine. If you only have one gear, it doesn't actually do anything. So up there, a few examples of what I do. We got some short form videos up at the top talking about some goofy stuff. And then uh, down at the bottom here, we have my uh, nightmare series talking about Graham Hancock's Ancient Apocalypse. Way too long, 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 long form content. So what is pseudo-archaeology? That is not a rhetorical question. I want to see a hand come up. Anyone want to take a guess? You. It is somebody espousing to have archaeological facts when said facts are based on, you know, this looks like this. So obviously, this, obviously they are lying to you about what's really going on here. Damn, that was a better definition than I was going to give. You want to give the rest of this presentation? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Could not have said it better myself. Uh, Pseudo-archaeology broadly is a uh, category of pseudoscience. It's something that works where uh, per people will take um, fragmentary archaeological evidence or misinterpreted actual archaeological evidence and use it to bolster any litany of these things that I have up here. I've thrown a list on the board. I will spare you the nightmare of reading it, but I'm sure that many of you are probably familiar with some of these. Everything from ancient aliens to Atlantis, many of these uh, tracing their roots to a general pseudo-archaeological pseudo concept known as hyper Diffusion. Has anybody heard of what hyperdiffusion is or is familiar with the term? So hyperdiffusion is a broad category for a early uh, 1900s idea of anthropology um, that kind of uh, dictated that all of the major civilizations on Earth are descended from one lost uh, master civilization. You can see how that gets into a little bit of dangerous territory and was very popular during the early 1900s. And unfortunately, many of these uh, you know, uh, conspiracies can still kind of trace their roots back to that. So up here I have a few of our uh, favorite faces in pseudo-archaeology. We have the infamous Giorgio Tsoukalos with his fantastic head of hair for uh, ancient aliens. Uh, Graham Hancock and the lovely dramatic thumbnail for his mockumentary series. Uh, and of course, uh, Eric Von Taniken's Chariots of the Gods. And then I just put the Richtot structure up there as well, which many will tell you is the ruins of Atlantis. So these are just fringe theories, right? Like there's nobody that actually believes these. I mean, we've all seen clips of ancient aliens and everyone, you know, the meme with the guy with the hair and all that. And so there's not actual people believing these, right? Like I hope so. But, but, you would be shocked to know that people do believe these. Now, I do want to preface this entire presentation by saying that a majority of people have the common sense enough to know that most of these things aren't true. Even doing what I do uh, on social media, short form, long form videos, a majority of people who watch these videos are able to, you know, get enough of their, uh, you know, brain power working to know that these things aren't true. That being said, they are becoming increasingly popular. I'm sure that I am not the only one who has noticed that in the past few years, a lot of these uh, more common social media platforms have allowed for a slew of misinformation, not only in the fields of archaeology and, you know, um various uh, you know, historical backgrounds, but in pretty much everything. Um, so it is you know, a bit of a double-edged sword. It's both the most powerful tool we've ever created and the most dangerous weapon we've ever created. Um, but the, the biggest problem with sort of the increase of this misinformation on social media is that it has a very low barrier of entry. So this has seen a large rise in the amount of creators and uh, I guess, yeah, I guess content creators who are creating uh, you know, these accounts that revolve solely around misinformation and perpetuating misinformation. So at kind of, we have a little bit of a, you know, I got my, my, my pyramid here. Don't you guys love pyramids? Um, and we have uh, at, at the base of my, uh, my, my uh, pseudoscience pyramid, we have the, uh, the really low barrier of entry. We have the uh, TikTok accounts. You can, you know, anyone with, a, with, a, with an internet connection can make one of those. And they, you know, rack up huge amounts of followers. We have one and a half million, almost five million, and another one and a half million. These accounts all being classic examples of people who will post, um, you know, litanies of misinformation. Then sort of, you know, the middle of the step pyramid, uh, we have uh, the YouTube channels. These are also things that have a low barrier of entry, uh, but require a little bit more, uh, you know, just because you have more time to say things, you kind of actually have to back it up instead of just, you know, blowing smoke for, you know, 60 seconds and calling it a day. Um, and so here are a couple examples uh, of accounts on um, YouTube that will frequently post um, pseudo-archaeology, sometimes fringe theories that have some foundation, but mostly into kind of the pseudo-archaeology camp. 
Um, and as I mentioned, these ones all have a very low barrier of entry. You don't need to have any qualifications in order to do these things. So again, anyone with an internet connection can make this happen. Um, but along with these uh, you know, sort of low budget uh, channels, uh, we've also seen an increase in sort of the high budget versions of this. Um, the most notable and the one that you're probably the most familiar with being Graham Hancock's Ancient Apocalypse, which I discussed ad nauseum last year. Um, and this isn't the first time this has happened. I mean, high budget pseudo archaeology is something that has been popular since things could have a budget. I mean, before that, it was you know ancient apocalypse, or no, it was uh, it was ancient aliens, and before that, it was uh, you know um, whatever his name was, Eric von Daniken and Chariots of the Gods. And if you keep going farther back, we get some more unsavory names, so we're not going to do that. Um, but why is it? Why is it that we find that so many people are drawn towards pseudoscience? Because these accounts have huge followings. It would be one thing if I was standing here telling you that there's thousands of these accounts putting out misinformation, but all of them have like 10 followers. And it's like, well, no one gives a shit, you know? But, but these accounts have huge amounts of followers. The, uh, the videos on them frequently get upwards of, you know, a million views, and clearly people are seriously engaging with them. So what I want to understand is why these accounts are so popular, the dangers that they could pose, and what we can learn from them. So I think that we can now kind of take it to the next level, which is talking about how this is sort of uh, th th how this syndrome manifests from a creator perspective. Now, don't get me wrong; I do abhor the term content creator. It makes me sound like I got you know popular doing what I did, doing TikTok dances, which I didn't. Although I should have; that would have honestly probably been a little easier. Mm. Would have saved me a lot of headaches, that's for sure. Um, but you know, in being uh, you know broadly, uh, uh, oh, oh God, uh oh, power surge. Oh, there we go. Okay. In, uh, in, in broadly being classed in the, the content creator umbrella, I've become unfortunately um, you know, uh, adept to understanding how the uh, sort of creator market and creator network works. So I'm going to give you guys a, a little unfortunate glimpse into the world of horror that it is. Um, so we're going to look at our little feedback loop here. Uh, it starts with a pseudo-archaeology video being produced. Um, you know, it could be for whatever reason. Most of the time, these people tend to kind of see another pseudo-archaeology video and then just pair it back whatever it says. Uh, there's really no kind of, you know, it's sort of a, a trickle down, the blind leading the blind sort of thing. So they'll create a video and then it gets a bunch of likes and views from people who are interested in it or are curious by it or are just sitting there blindly scrolling and it's just a little reflex that we have. Now those are all, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the term interactions. So uh, a, a algorithm in both YouTube and TikTok and all these different platforms will kind of tally up how successful a video is based on the interactions it's getting. So the more times that a video is liked, the more times someone comments on it, the more more times it's shared, the greater the, interaction, the greater the interaction, and the more the algorithm will promote it. So weirdly, they sort of make their content continue to be more popular by making it more controversial, and the more that it stirs up people sort of having a little bit of a, a spat over it, the more popular it's going to be. So in turn, it's promoted by the algorithm, which makes it reach a wider audience, giving it even more interaction. And then the creator gets that little dopamine spike in their brain because look at how many new subscribers they just got. They're like, clearly this is working. Doesn't matter if it's ethical, it works, you know? And so they will go on to create another video and the cycle continues. And the result is something like this. How many of you are familiar with the Bosnian pyramids? Good, because they don't exist. The Bosnian pyramids <laughs> do not exist. The Bosnian pyramids are a uh, sort of elaborate marketing scheme by a Bosnian businessman. They have been debunked countless times over and were done as sort of a, a marketing tool to draw people to a small Bosnian village. Uh, you know, he made himself the, uh, the president of the, the, the Pyramid Science Foundation or whatever it was and is raking in tons of government money doing it. So clearly, it's a pretty good racket for himself. Now, all of that being said, this video is a video where an individual is talking about about the Bosnian pyramids as if they were fact. He gives absolutely no reference to the litany of information backing up the fact that they are completely not real. He uses it as evidence that you know every archaeologist is lying to you and the truth is not what it seems and that you know they're out to get you. And the thing that I really want to highlight, I love that we're all having a little bit of a laugh here, but the truly grim thing about this is this video has 30 million views. When I sort of generally ask this room if anyone knows what the Bosnian pyramids were, welcome, no, 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 right this way, right this way. You guys want me to start over? No. <laughs> we have fun here. So when I ask this room if you guys know what the Bosnian pyramid is, I am very happy to see that nobody did. But what I can tell you is because of this video, 
30 million people know what the Bosnian pyramid is. 30 million people have been told that something that isn't true is. They have had no one to challenge those beliefs, and on top of that, they have had the entire thing served to them on a, you know, tray of thinking that the world is out to get them and that people are lying to them, and that the people who do actually have the ability to, you know, be able to actually look at these sites and determine whether they're real or not are all trying to keep them in the dark. And that's very scary. 30 million people. I would hazard a guess that maybe, maybe that little point one at the end there had known about this before it was released. And now that amount of people know because of this video. And that is kind of frightening. So what's the problem? I see this comment every once in a while float by where someone's like, oh, I don't get what the big deal is, you know? Like, it's just what's so bad if someone believes that a pyramid's in Bosnia, you know? And I guess on paper, you know, I really can't argue with that. That's a fair point. Um, but it, it, it breathes to a, a much larger problem because pseudo-archaeology and pseudoscience as a whole is the beginning of a pipeline. Inherently, there is not a lot wrong with, you know, thinking that there's a pyramid in Bosnia or thinking that, you know, the Great Pyramids of Giza weren't a tomb and that they were something else. And now I could be giving a whole different lecture kind of talking about the implications of that. There is a lot of racism rooted in sort of ancient aliens theories and things like that. But I want to say that generally someone questioning what an archaeological narrative isn't inherently a bad thing. But the problem, as I said, is that it is the beginning of a pipeline. Because the moment you start to listen to someone who has no credentials and is telling you that the people with credentials are lying to you, you start to fall down a kind of slippery slope. So this is kind of the tip of the iceberg. Something you will notice is that a lot of the people who peddle this misinformation are people who have absolutely no background within these studies. And I also want to preface by saying that I am a firm believer that something that I think our generation has to try and shake as we move forward into our professional careers is that people don't need to have degrees in order to be professionals at what they do. I think that sort of having that barrier of entry of not being allowed to talk in a certain field unless you have you know, a, a X amount of PhDs is something that I think we kind of need to work to dismantle. That being said, these people are speaking as though they have a greater level of expertise than actual professionals in the field and that their narratives and their opinions are somehow greater than those of people who are actually experts in it. So this isn't people who are, you know, amateurs being, you know, shut down by science. They're people who are claiming to know more than actual professionals and that is where the difference is. So you'll notice we got uh, Jimmy up there, my, my, my main man from Bright Insight. He's a, a bit of a, a repeat YouTube offender. Uh, he has a degree in communication and sociology, which he applies very very well. Uh, I'm sure he's done quite well for himself making all these videos. Um, as for Graham Hancock, the infamous uh, you know, um, creator of, of uh, Ancient Apocalypse, he also has a degree in sociology. As for this guy, I don't know, he has a TikTok account. That's good enough for me, you know, it seems to work. <laughs> so what, what I want to highlight here is that not only do these individuals and a lot of the people who peddle these conspiracies not have any background within the fields that they're talking about, but they actively go out of their way to ignore the opinions of professionals. They aren't just kind of being like, hey guys, here's something I thought about, and like, what do you guys think of this? Which is fine, nobody cares. Like, if you have, That's how science works. We kind of want people to do that. But they're not doing that. They are using this as a way to kind of undermine what the actual research of professionals is. Um, and I do think that a lot of them say it for clicks, which is its own ethical dilemma, but you know, that's not a conversation I'm going to have right now. Um, and broadly, they end up kind of casting doubt on the scientific system. They cast doubt on the processes that actually give us the information that has given us the life that we have around us. <clears throat> so we can take this a little bit deeper. So as I said, this is a pipeline. Not uh, individual accounts talking about these things are not responsible for direct radicalization. Instead, all of these accounts kind of form a Venn diagram chain that the, uh, the algorithm will promote, sort of taking you farther down it. You cannot blame any link in the chain. You can only blame the fact that the algorithm sort of works to radicalize people. So as we work our way down this chain a little bit, let's see where it's taking us. At best, they will say that you know, the experts' you know, opinions are incorrect. At worst, they outright vilify them. In shows like Ancient Apocalypse, Graham Hancock will frequently go out of his way to talk about how the dogmas of science are trying to silence him, a narrative that many people who feel outcast by the scientific community will you know, resonate with and feel like he is someone, the only person, who's actually telling them the truth. And that's a very you know, dangerous thing to think. Is You're not even caring what the individual is saying now. All you know is that they're lying to you. 
Which brings us to our next thing, is that they are hiding something. This is a word that gets thrown around a lot in these conspiracy videos. And most of the time, I want to give the benefit of the doubt that it's being used in an innocent intent. But this is a word that is used all too frequently to assign whoever you want to whatever you want. And it is not long before these conspiracies will start to bring up dog whistles, such as the Rothschilds, and the Illuminati, and the elite. And again, this is not each individual being responsible for the sort of things that they are uh, you know, leading others towards, but they do form an almost perfect line as you start to go farther down this rabbit hole, where one minute you'll be listening to a video about a pyramid, and at the end of it, he'll be talking about the Rothschilds Island in Antarctica. And it's not long before you start to end up in some pretty murky territory. Uh, a great example that I have here, this is from uh, Bright Insights Channel. We have, uh, you know, world-renowned Egyptologist Tucker Carlson talking about the Great Pyramids of Giza. <laughs> now, uh, no, no, this isn't a you know, class about or lecture about politics. I wouldn't trust Tucker Carlson to tell me too many things, but I definitely don't know if I'd trust what he has to say about the Great Pyramids of Giza. Okay, special interest intermission, everybody. Uh, something that I've been very interested in for a very long time is the psychology be behind cults and hate groups. I find something very fascinating in what can motivate people to be, uh, I don't know, sell themselves to something so hateful, so self-destructive, and something so vicious towards the world around them. And again, I want to preface by saying that these are not a direct one-to-one -one comparison. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, I, I swear. Um, and so I, I've kind of put a few different examples up here. We have, you know, Keith Raniere of Nixium, we have the uh, Yearning for Zion Ranch, uh, this was the Unite the Right rally, and this is the first broad daylight Klan rally on the East Coast in none other than the town of Milo, Maine that I showed you my picture of in front of earlier. Maine, as far north as you can go on the East Coast, this was in 1923. So I always wondered to myself, especially after learning that while attending the university, how is this even possible? Now, there is a, you know, a, a pretty famous line that nobody knows they're in a cult, and that's exactly the way it works, because all of these groups work to sort of isolate individuals. They work to radicalize them not only by telling them what they should believe, but more importantly, what they shouldn't believe, the people who are lying to them, the people who are trying to steer them away, and that they are the one true voice of truth, and that everyone else is sort of trying to guide them into the darkness. So the way that a group as you know, awful and vicious as the Klan was able to survive in a state that was almost entirely white at the beginning of the 1900s is because there was nobody there who was able to represent the groups that were being you know, um, sort of vilified. So they were able to recruit heavily because they could just come up, show what, you know, whatever the thing was that the people were upset about and be like, oh, well, they did it. And th that's where it ends up because there's nobody there to challenge it. And that is a terrifying prospect. So. From there, we take it to the bottom of the iceberg, where we are now kind of down the rabbit hole of pseudoscience. We are now no longer in directly the realm of pseudo-archaeology. We have kind of fallen to the very, very bottom. And in this way, it operates more like a cult than it does you know, fringe theories or like conspiracies. Because they have already been told that there are people that are out to get them, people that are trying to lie to them, that there's only one source of information they can truly get. And by doing that, they've isolated themselves so far that they've made themselves open to listen to whatever they say. And we know that this is something that's happened. We've seen this happen in the last few years. I saw most of you nod at the beginning of this presentation when I asked if you guys had you know, seen kind of an increase in misinformation and pseudoscience online. We know that it works, and we know that it's been radicalizing people. So pseudoarchaeology is not the sole way that people enter this pipeline. It is one of many funnels that leads people into this really, really dark abyss. I love this poster. <laughs> I am sure all of you are probably pretty familiar with this. Um, and while you know, I think a lot of conspiracy theorists will use this as sort of their little, you know, uh, the, the rallying symbol, and I think they should, it's pretty lovely, I think it's actually more pertinent than people give it credit for. Because I think that most conspiracies can be summed up with these four words. I want to believe. It doesn't matter if there's evidence proving against it. It doesn't matter how many people have unanimously and unequivocally told you that what you're saying is incorrect and what you're believing is wrong, because you want to believe it. Once you really want to believe something, there is nobody that can stop you from believing it. That is why we see people who are in groups that we can't even wrap our heads around how they got there, because it was a very slow drip to get to the bottom. But isn't that extreme? I mean, I started this video talking about the Bosnian pyramid and I just had you know, a picture of you know, the, the January 6th insurrection. That seems like a little bit of a slippery slope. And yes, I would say that making it directly in, you know, in however many minutes that was, a 10 minute transition, is pretty quick. So I would not be surprised if your heads are spinning a little bit. But the reason I bring this up is because I unfortunately know this pipeline very well. 
Now, this is something that I have never talked about. I talked about this once in a similar presentation I gave at the University of Maine. So this will kind of be my first time really sharing it. And I even have this on video. So now this will be something that I will be able to share with the world. Um, when I was about 15 years old, I had un, un, uh, unfettered access to the internet, as so many of us did, which is both a great thing and a terrible thing. Now, uh, you know, being a 15-year-old in around 2015, 2016, um, I got really into sort of like the, you know, edgy atheist YouTube content. Mega cringe, I know. Um, but, you know, it, it, it uh, I, I, you know, I think maybe there's still some vestiges of it, but I try my best to correct. Um, you know, and, and as I watched these videos as, you know, a identity-less 15-year-old, I was grasping for someone to kind of tell me what to believe. And it's a lot easier for someone to tell you who to be mad at than to tell you who to trust and the people to listen to. And before long, after listening to people like this, they started to talk about things that weren't, you know, debates about theology or discussions of science. They were talking about, like, the feminists are out to get you. And it wasn't long before I started to fall down that rabbit hole, too. Now, thankfully, I was able to be in a high school where there was a lot of people with a lot of different ways of thinking. And I was in an amazing friend group who were able to kind of de-radicalize and take me off that trajectory before I went too far down it. And I am infinitely grateful for them. I know the power that being able to reach out to people and being able to correct them before they're too far gone can have. And they were able to kind of divert me off that pretty quickly down it. Now, I sort of left that part of my life in, in the past and I kind of kept it buried. I'm like, I don't even want to process that right now. And about two years ago, I was like, okay, like, let me think about that for a second. And I sort of acknowledged it for the first time. And out of my curiosity, I kind of you know, went back online. I, I went to go check in on some of the accounts that I used to follow back when I was you know, a 15-year-old almost, almost 10 years ago. And now some of them no longer exist, and thankfully none of them have a really large following. But they have descended into a realm that I couldn't even have wrapped my head around if you had told me it was where they were going to end up just a handful of years before. At the best, it was homophobia and transphobia. At worst, it was direct defense of neo-Nazis and neo-Nazi ideals. Like open, blatant, maybe dog whistle coded, but still things that are absolutely abhorrent. I felt a pit in my stomach, knowing that I, as an impressionable 15-year-old who just was looking for people to kind of, you know, kind of pick my brain and make me think about the other side and stuff like that, if I had stayed on that, I could have ended up just like them. And that is a terrifying prospect and exactly why I do what I do today. Because I know the power that being able to put good information into the world has. I know how dangerous it is to leave people alone with these ideas and never have them be challenged. I think that an issue that we have within you know, the scientific world is that these videos are things that, you know, it's just not even worth it. Like I was talking about the Bosnian pyramid, like why am I going to waste my breath on that? And you know what? We shouldn't have to waste our breaths on it. But unfortunately, someone has to do it. Because if it's out there, 30 million people are listening to it. So, I kind of have a two-pronged approach for what I try and do. Firstly, is kind of my bread and butter of debunking misinformation. This is me talking about Snapchat news. This is an old one. I think I made that when I was still in school. Um, but this is uh, you know, a two-minute Snapchat news video that took me 30 minutes to debunk. Here's the first episode of my Ancient Apocalypse series. And then on the second kind of side of things, I also try and teach facts without having to, you know, wrap them in the, the, the pseudoscience ball in order to, you know, teach them. Because I think as important as it is to dismantle these things, it's also really important to just put good information into the world without tainting it with somebody else's bullshit. So here we have the uh, first episode of my recent documentary series, Dark Roots, um, talking about the ruins of Guadalupe in uh, New Mexico. And then down there is a um, on-site documentary that I did at uh, Carajan Tepe when I was there uh, back this past spring. So with all that said, I, I'm going to transition to kind of the second part of this. Um, and I want to talk to you guys a little bit more specifically about science communication. Because all of this is good. This could have been my little thesis wall, we'll clap, blah, blah, blah. But I think that you know, it's much more important to kind of figure out what we actually do with that information. Because it's a little bit grim. I like to think I maybe ended it on a nice note. But I think that we do have a little bit more we need to discuss. Science communication in the age of the internet, a presentation by Milo Rossi. <laughs> <laughs> so as scientists, what can we learn from pseudoscience? <laughs> It may seem like a bit of a, a stupid question because there's not much that you'd want to learn from it, but there's actually a lot that we can learn from pseudo-archaeology. First, and most importantly, is people are interested in archaeology. I lost count of the amount of comments that I got on my Graham Hancock series of people being like, man, I just watched this video with my friends like one night on Netflix because you know I was smoking a joint and there was nothing else to watch and I like history. And I was like, 
I can't argue with that, fair, you know? But there's nothing else for them to watch. There is nothing else that scratches that itch that everyone has about learning about the past, about learning about history. And so they had no choice but to watch Graham Hancock. And so you have all these people stoned on their couch, absorbing what Graham Hancock has to say. And it, 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 they have no reason to question it. It's a high budget Netflix series. And so there's nobody who's going to challenge them. They think that what he's, they have no reason to doubt him. And so what we can learn from that is that people are actually interested in this. There is a market for it, and people want to learn it. It also has a very broad audience. 30 million people watching a video about a pyramid that doesn't exist is absolutely insane. I challenge you to find 30 million people who agree on literally anything else. Not that they agree on it, but uh, I, I don't even want to think about that part. And the biggest thing that it sort of highlights is that us as scientists, us as you know, young science communicators, have to focus on science communication. We are at the beginning of sort of a revolution in the way that we can teach the world. And I think all of us here in sort of an academic setting have a very traditional view of how this is done. Because traditional science communication is, um, it's not perfect. And I think that we need to adapt it. So, the, the issue with, I think, modern science communication is sort of the traditional way that many people have learned is they will learn either you know, by reading papers or by going to a lecture hall or if you were unfortunate enough to go to the university when I did, uh, by Zoom lectures, um, which you know, maybe will have like 300 kids in it or something like that. But most rooms are bottlenecked by the amount of people that are in them. This room has, I don't know, 30 some odd people in it. I counted in this picture that I just pulled off Google Images and it's got 60 students in it, which is great. That's 60 people who are gonna know what they have to say. This is 20 people people that know what I'm going to have to say. But that's a really small amount. We're talking about numbers that are upwards of the 10,000s here with the potential of social media. So the numbers that we can do with you know, scientific papers and classrooms are just dwarfed by the reach that we are able to have through you know, social media and those um, you know, methods. Not only that, but these methods sort of bottleneck who can actually learn from this. All of us are immensely privileged to be able to sit in this room and actually learn from one another. Whether we are students, whether we are teachers, whether we are locals, all of us are able to come here and sit here today to listen to this. Not everyone can do that. And the fact that a lot of education is locked behind a paywall literally means that you have to be able to afford to be educated. And that is a horrifying thing. I think that we are way past the point where that should be completely broken down because we now have tools in our pockets that are capable of reaching millions of people around the entire world. So we no longer have to have these things locked behind paywalls in our classrooms. That's why I have a camera running at the back of this room. When I was talking to Grace about making this presentation, I knew that I'd be giving it to a hall of, you know, between 20 and 40 people, but it needs to be out to more people than that. If I was only telling this to 40 people, frankly, it doesn't really matter that much. You guys will all go home and tell your parents about it, but what is the greater impact it's having on the world if it's uh, confined when it walks out this door? So, and for, for many people, I think that archaeology, or science as a whole, feels very inaccessible. And I almost can't blame them for it. Science can really feel like kind of this ivory tower that people have a difficult time to penetrate. And whether or not that's true or not, I think many of us know that it's not something that it intends to be, but a lot of people feel that way. So frankly, it doesn't matter whether or not we think it is or think it isn't. If people feel like that, we within the community have an obligation to try and make it a place that is much more welcoming and does a much better job of pulling people into the fold than making them feel like they're not allowed there. Because if we continue to make it feel like a place that is exclusive and somewhere that people aren't allowed inside, we are driving them right into the hands of pseudoscience. If we don't open them with welcome arms, Graham Hancock will. He'll tell them those people over there who, you know, they, they, they shunned me as well. And I am, you know, I am, I am the shepherd. I will take care of you. And, you know, we almost can't blame anyone but ourselves when people are scared away by it. So we have a responsibility to make the knowledge that we gain in these classrooms and that you gain while doing your degrees accessible to the world. So it's time to kind of bring in the new. It's time that we have to kind of revolutionize the way that we're actually teaching people. We are in a golden age of science communication. This little number, very pixelated number that we have right here, is the total amount of views on my YouTube channel. That number, for those of you who hate decimal points as much as I do, is almost half a billion. Half a billion, that is an enormous number, and I'm not even that big of a YouTuber. Half a billion views, I'm, I'm assuming there's gonna be a lot of repeats. There's gonna be a lot of the same people saying the same things. But if we're gonna just go one to one, half a billion people have heard what I have to say. Half a billion people have heard my voice. That is absolutely terrifying. But it is the single greatest tool we have ever been given. I want you to have a little thought experiment. If you could go back in time, think of a scientist that you love, Mary Curie, Charles Darwin, anyone. 
You went back in time and you told them that there was a way that they could have their words broadcasted to half a billion people around the world. We have a tool in our hands that is so unbelievably powerful, I don't even know how to put it into words. And I do think it's easy to write off. I think many of us, myself included, especially before I started on uh, social media, look at it as something that's kind of vapid and insipid. Because let's be honest, it's the most powerful tool in the world and it's used for TikTok dances. It's kind of lame. <laughs> And yet, we can turn it into something so much more because look at that potential. If you told someone that you could fill a classroom with half a billion people and they could teach the, what they have to say to them, they would do it in a heartbeat. So we have an obligation to be able to save science with science communication. I am not the only one doing this. I don't want it to sound like I am the only one doing this because I'm definitely not. I am you know, pretty high in sort of the archaeology side of things, but I am far from the only young person doing science communication. I put a couple of my uh, friends and colleagues up here who I have been fans of some long since before I started on YouTube who are amazing science communicators. One of my favorites being Atlas Pro does videos on uh, geology and biogeography. He is one of the best science communicators I've ever seen and really knows how to use the platform. Stefan Milo, another archaeology Milo in ancient America is doing wonderful videos on uh, history and archaeology. Geology Hub knows how to handle you know, a ge geologic concept in ways that I can't even put into words no matter how much I love geology. History with Kaylee, often filming on site in places like Egypt, being able to bring these remote and inaccessible locations directly to people's living rooms. And then on short form, we have Lindsay, who is someone who does great videos on uh, zoology and biology. And then uh, Astro Alexandria, who does videos on astronomy. All of these people are young people within our age demographic who are being heard by millions of people. And that is an unbelievably powerful tool. Now this may seem a little dramatic because when you think of a renaissance you think of you know the marble pillars and the togas and the frat parties. <laughs> but <laughs> we are at the beginning of a renaissance. The fact that we are able to reach the amount of people that we can is something that has never been done before on the planet. And it is the most powerful tool we've ever made. It is both a powerful tool for peace and a terrifying weapon as well. And it is only something that can be interpreted and used by whoever's hand it's in. So I want to encourage all of you to know that I am not some you know, person who was just born into the social media thing and like this was just my th you know, thing that was chosen for me. I had no idea I was going to do this. Uh, the, year, the summer before I graduated college, I was sitting in a work truck pumping wells in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, thinking that I was going to be an environmental scientist, which I would have loved to have done. I decided to make a TikTok, and here I am. I don't know how that happened, but I want that to stand as inspiration to all of you that uh, there is no difference here. Every single one of you has words that you want to say. Every single one of you has beliefs that you want to preach. Every single one of you has lessons and passions and things that you want to share with the world. And you can. You don't need to have a PhD. You don't need to be able to you know, go through 15 years of school and rack up half a million dollars of debt. You don't need to do that. You all have a phone in your pocket right now that is capable of reaching the entire world. I want you to think about how powerful of a tool that is. And I want you to know that I am not the only one doing this. And that I hope all of you will be inspired enough to know that you can also do this as well. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I'd like to give a big thank you to Grace for welcoming me here today. And I'd like to give a big thank you to Virginia Tech for having me. This really is an absolute honor to be here speaking at your institution. Definitely a, a big resume builder. And I'd like to give a big thank you to uh, you know, uh, the professors for having me here and welcoming me within your classroom. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> wow, who is that guy? He can really talk. I feel like that's also the first time you guys have seen me just like, I mean, every video I do is kind of off the cuff. I have my bullet point notes and I just sort of talk. I don't write scripts for any of my videos, uh, but that's a great example of what it looks like when I'm just yapping. Anyway, I'd like to thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you were able to take something away from it. I look forward to hearing what you think about it. And, and I appreciate all of your patience as my team and I work on the Philip Zeba video. It's going to be long and it's put kind of a log jam in everything that we're working on right now, but it's going to be totally worth it because it's really good. And luckily for you, it's going to probably be the next video that I release. So mark your calendars. It will probably be either this coming Sunday or next Sunday, but keep an eye out for it and join me at the live premiere. Block out a bunch of time because it's going to be almost four hours long. So I'd like to thank you all very much for watching. And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to the folks at Virginia Tech for allowing me to speak at their institution. It was an honor to be there and really a pleasure to speak with just such an engaging and enjoyable audience. If you want me to come speak at your school, 
Give me a ring. Well, an email, I guess. You don't have my phone number. Unless you do. Do you have my phone number? What is wrong with you? Anyway, I gotta get back to editing this thing because if it's gonna come out in you know, the two week normal upload date, I really gotta double down. And if I'm gonna get it out this next Sunday, well, I gotta quadruple down. So I got work to do. But I'd like to thank you all very much for watching. Stay curious, stay inquisitive, and I'll see you at the Philip Zeba video.